this is where Finston is about ready to speak for this meeting, and I'm going to put the uh, tape recorder right up this night. Thank you, Doris, Mr. Allen, Miss Stephan, Carla, ladies, and whatever. <laughs> In one way, I'm just a little bit disappointed that it isn't exclusively a ladies' audience. <laughs> the, reason, the reason for it is that I have wanted to say what I'm going to say here tonight for probably at least 10 years, but never quite felt I dared to. You ladies have often been told that you were the most important factor in this entire movement. But I don't believe anybody has ever explained to you why. And this is what I've wanted to do. And tonight I thought I had to do it, to unleash, let's say, the power that we have to have and have to apply to drive this program to a completion. Now, most of you, have not had to listen to me for about two years. Well, tonight, your luck ran out. <laughs> and I'm going to say it anyway. But my key purpose was to unleash the greatest power that I think that we have out there to complete the job. But in another way, it's real nice that all of these ladies, or these men, came to this ladies' meeting because I believe I found another power that might take us to that completion. Why don't we have just ladies' meetings out there and the men will come? <laughs> Maybe that's why the county meetings, some of the county meetings are not well attended who wants to spend the whole evening among those bums. <laughs> but if the gals are there and liven it up, it makes it a little bit different. I was going to tell you that you'd really lucked out that I wasn't going to make a speech when I came, but with the change of the situation, maybe I'm going to have to go beyond just the one statement that I was going to make. I am very, very scared of what's happening out there and the condition that I think that we're really in. I believe that we have very, very little time left, not only to solve our problem in agriculture, but I believe that the economy of this entire nation is dependent on what we do. There's nobody that hates a flag waiver worse than I do. And still, maybe some of it's got to be done, because I think we have to look at what there is left for us, for our children and our grandchildren, if we don't do what needs to be done and do it now. Perhaps we do it for a selfish reason. But really, all of the great accomplishments in this country have come about not for the right reasons. The right thing was done for the wrong reason. Injustices, extreme injustices, have been righted, not because the people had, let's say, the sympathy in their heart or the determination to do the right thing. The right thing seemed to almost invariably be a byproduct. I'm referring to one thing, for one thing, to the abolition of slavery in these United States. And I think we've sung the praises of the people involved in doing it often enough and in enough of a twisted manner that we have completely forgotten that the Civil War was not fought to free the slaves. The Civil War was fought to preserve the Union, to bring the southern states back in, 
to the Union after having seceded. The freeing of slaves was almost a vicious thing in the way it was done. The slaves were freed as a war measure to cripple the South, to destroy the economy and force the people in the, in the Southern Army back to those farms or the entire South would collapse economically in general. The right thing was done for the wrong reason. Maybe it is the wrong reason that we're trying to save ourselves in agriculture, but it's gone far, far beyond that. I believe that we are so close to total collapse of our economy in this country that it is to me at least horrifying. We're having both an increase of unemployment. We're having a decided increase apparently again in inflation. A depression with an inflation. This is about the most horrifying situation that you could possibly have. Many of us, including myself, went through the depression of the 30s. And there was, in a sense, a way to protect yourself if you were smart enough to see what was coming. You could sell, before the depression hit, whatever you had, turn it into cash. And your money was backed by gold. And in the depression, you could be worth four or five times as much as you had been before because of the Depression. But now we're facing a double shot, one from each side, inflation and depression. So if the inflationary trend continues, and it has to, unless we solve the basic problem, it will accelerate, get ever and ever greater. So how do you protect yourself when you're being hit from both sides? If you sell out, turn your property into cash, cash that is worth absolutely nothing if the economy fails, because it's not backed with anything anymore. No gold, no silver, and the only thing that is holding it is confidence. <laughs> How much is that quarter, that half dollar worth in your pocket when the collapse comes? It's a piece of junk. You'd be better off if you had a pocket full of washers. At least you could use them for something. They got a hole in the middle. <laughs> but now after you go through that, and everything that you have or have turned into paper, any kind, stocks, bonds, cash, whatever, that makes no difference. That then, of course, becomes totally worthless. So you can't protect yourself that way. Then if you get hit from the other side with a depression, then you lose everything else that you've got, and that means you're going to get it, and everybody from both sides. There's no way that you can plan ahead against that. Well, the raw materials of any nation is the basis of its economy. Only the God-given things, nothing else, adds to the economy. Everything else, every segment of this society, merely consumes the raw materials as they go through. And the raw materials, properly priced at a fair price, full fair price, they turn into their sevenfold earned income. In other words, for every dollar that is paid to the American farmer, by the time it gets through the entire economy, it will have generated seven dollars of earned income. For our minerals, our oil, so forth, the ratio is a little smaller. It is five to one. Now, I don't think very much of the economists in these United States. I do not consider it a science, not as they're doing it, 
I consider it merely a rigging of different groups. They have not yet recognized, and they refuse to recognize, the importance of the raw materials or agricultural production. I say they are not a science because they are refusing to recognize the basic law of that science. How far do you think that our chemists would get if they completely and flatly refused to recognize the laws of chemistry? How many men do you think we'd put into space if our scientists refused to recognize the existence of the law of gravity? How long do you think we'd keep moving if our scientists flatly refused to recognize that water has a freezing point or a boiling point? And yet, basic as it is, our economists are flatly refusing to recognize it and are actually working against it. How many times have you read that everybody needs food? And if we make food cheap, that's going to help everybody. They're bleeding the economy, and thoroughly. In fact, the way they're doing it reminds me pretty much of the medical science going back to about the years 1200 or the medieval ages. When a man was sick, they cut his wrist and drew blood off of him. They claimed that that's where the disease was, in the blood. So the more blood they could take off him, the sooner he'd get back. That's right, and all of you remember it. The barber was in reality the doctor then, because I guess maybe he had the sharpest knife. <laughs> but that's what they did. What do we do today? We give them blood, don't we? But that's what they've been doing to American agriculture and to the economy. They've been bleeding it to death. And eventually it's got to quit. The end comes, and I think it is very, very close. If you read what they have to say, even just the superficial things, you'll find them very, very contradictory, depending on which group they're talking to or about. What are you hearing about labor? How must they get an increase in wages? By greater production, doesn't it? Don't they? He's entitled to no more, including stewardesses, than the increase in their production. And that sounds all right, don't it? But what did they tell you as farmers? Or tell people is going to give them cheaper food if the farmers will produce more? So if we produce more, we're to get less. And one by one, they have bled every economic segment in American agriculture. And I think it is planned, well planned. They never bleed us all at the same time. The cattlemen have taken it on the chin for quite a while now, very severely. Now they're getting the hog men and the poultry producers, and they're promising them that they're going to get relief when they get you grain men in a hole. Your salvation is going to come through the losses of the grain producers. We've never been all at the same time in the deep hole, always one or two segments doing all right for a year or two, and then they get it all over again. And that keeps us pretty much divided. Because really, and honestly and truly, if you're producing grain and no livestock, I think that if you'll be real honest with yourself, you don't even give a damn about the grain man. If the grain man is losing his shirt and you're buying it cheap and selling your cattle and hogs at a profit, I don't believe that you really honestly and truly care much about the group that is losing. And by keeping us in that kind of situation over the period of years, we've never all been in the same hole at the same time, and probably won't be until we all get cleaned out.
when there is no way to continue to produce, when there are no more jobs, when there is no more money out there, or no more faith in the currency that you do have. You've got a start of it right now. We are facing anarchy in a good many of our very heavily populated areas. In fact, this is a true story, absolutely, so help me. I think it illustrates pretty much what you've got in your economists and why they're not going to solve it. In about 1860, in England, the Academy of Sciences was developed. And they wouldn't let the economists or the statisticians into the Academy of Science because the honest-to-goodness scientists just didn't believe that the economists and the statisticians were conducting a science. But about 1870, an economist made a great big splash with a bunch of figures that he had put together and a prediction for about 30 years ahead what was going to happen to the economy in London. The prediction was so startling that in, 19, in 1875, they admitted the economists into the Academy of Sciences and elected one of them as chairman of it. The big hit he made was by his prediction and the figures that he put together. The prediction was that by 1890, people would begin to leave London, and London would start shrinking, and that by 1903, there wouldn't be anybody living in London anymore. Now, what was the reason that he gave why all of this would take place? and why London would be completely emptied out by, by 1903 is because by that time, the horse manure would be seven feet, four inches deep in the streets. <laughs> now, it is my opinion that even today, they're still not big enough to look over that pile of horse manure. <laughs> and I think it's what they're still dealing with. So who do you think is going to solve your problem for you? <laughs> who do you think is going to do it? Do you think that with all the education of the housewife that you can give her and the problem as it exists or our plight out here in agriculture, do you ever believe that any housewife is going to walk into the supermarket and demand to pay more for pork chops because you need it? <laughs> you really believe that? Then who's going to do it? How are you going to get the system to do it? And what is the system? Last week, I believe it was either Wednesday or Thursday night, I listened to the Tomorrow Show, Tom Snyder's show. It was a program that probably ordinarily wouldn't interest us much, but it interests me deeply because of one statement that was repeated any number of times. He had on three gamblers from Las Vegas. And with those three gamblers, I guess maybe you'd have to refer to him as a gambler too, was Amarillo Slim. Now, Amarillo Slim, for those that may not know him, is supposedly the greatest poker player in the United States. But these other three gamblers that they had claimed that they could beat any blackjack game in the United States, that they had a system. Well, basically, the system was a very, very good memory where they could keep track of the cards that had come out and know what was left in the deck and then use the percentages to up their bets or lower them or get out altogether depending on what was left in that deck. That was the real system. But the reason that they were on the program 
was because they had been barred from eight casinos in Las Vegas. Well, immediately, because they could win, so the casinos just wouldn't let them play. Well, Tom was grinding at how can they do that? Those are public gambling places, and that's really what people go to win. So then how can they keep somebody from playing that can win? And Amarella Slim, who contributed really nothing to the program, said, because you have to play according to the golden rule. And it was left right there. So they talked again about the difficulty of getting it into court. They couldn't even get their suit, a suit of three million against eight casinos out there. They couldn't even get it into court. So Tom again, well, how can that be? Our justice system in these United States demands that a man has a right to go into court and have his uh, claim aired or at least tried. And Amarillo says, you can't do it because you've got to play according to the golden rule. <laughs> so they went on again. And what was the possibility of winning? And how could they handle the political system out there? And various things were suggested. And again, Amarillo Slim says, you can't do it. You got to play according to the golden rule. About this, that's all he had said that far. About this time, Tom Snyder was getting pretty disgusted with him. He says, oh, come on. He said, what do you mean the golden rule's got nothing to do with it? Slim says, the golden rule's got everything to do with it. All right, thinks Tom says, what do you mean by the golden rule? Slim said, those as has the gold makes the rule. <laughs> what you have to play according to and that is exactly what we have to play according to in American agriculture as long as we continue in our present most ignorant stupid system of bar of the marketing that we could possibly have that's going to the market and saying what will you give me accept it go home and grumble raise another crop and take another loss. Now again, according to these economists that I despise, because I think they're leading the entire nation down to doomsday, one of the things that they're pointing out about farm income that is a very bright spot to them. According to the economic indicator, farm income is broken down with farm income and off-the-farm income. Off-the-farm income is now almost half again as big as the farm income is. And they point to this as a very bright spot, that the farmers have the opportunity to make their living somewhere else and still produce the food that they want everybody to have for nothing. Now, really, I don't think there is any great percentage of our farmers, our farm wives, our sons, son-in-laws, daughters, and daughter-in-laws that are going to the farm, to town, to those jobs to augment their income. And yet they're getting that group that is doing that is getting half again more from that source than all of us put together for producing the food in this nation. And why is it necessary? About two months ago, I put together some figures. And I emphasize the two months ago because the figures would not hold today. They have changed. At the time I put these figures together, Hogs were at about $31, cattle about $34, $35 in there somewhere, ranging depending on what market you were talking about. And the broiler and turkey producers were losing about 10 cents a pound. But the price of the hogs and the cattle at that time also figured out to be a, a terrific loss. And what it amounted to, putting those figures together, 
is that the American farmer, some producer, somewhere, is paying 10 cents a pound for every pound of meat that anybody in the United States eats. At every dinner table, some farmer is putting it out a dime for every plate on that table. So what are you working for? Why are you, the wives, going to town to get a job? Or why is your husband working at night in some factory? Or your daughter or daughter-in-law, son or son-in-law, going off the farm to augment their income so that you can keep on paying 10 cents a pound for every pound of meat that everyone in the United States eats every day. That's what you're doing. And the economists think that's wonderful. Well, who's going to change the situation? What's going to keep us from collapsing? So yeah, we elected a new president, didn't we? <laughs> So if we got that much time left, are we going to wait two years to find out that he isn't going to do anything about it either? <laughs> now, I'm not condemning him. If it's of any information to you, I voted for him. And would again and again. <laughs> He's a terrific guy. And if anybody is going to solve some problems, I think he has the opportunity because of his drive, his ability, and his determination. The man did in two years what no other politician has ever done in less than eight years. Jack Kennedy, whom we admired very much, or I personally did at any rate, the way he organized, put together the machinery to get himself in as president, even though he started with a pretty good base, a very important United States senator, he didn't make it the first time. He was beat by Adelaide Stevenson, who got the nomination. He could have been vice president, or could have had the nomination for vice president, I believe. But he didn't take it. He started again, organizing immediately for the next election, four years. And he made it faster, really, than anybody that we know of. Carter did it in two years. The man's got something on the ball. But can he solve our problem? I say no. He doesn't have a ghost of a chance. If Carter goes too much against the golden rule, <laughs> the money interests will pull the strings on him. But you elected congressmen, too, didn't you, and senators? How much good do you think they're going to do you? Do you know how much political power that the American farmers have in Congress today? You've heard me give the story before. When out of 435 congressmen in the United States, we had 27 that came from rural congressional districts. And all it takes to qualify a district as a rural district is if 20% of the voters directly receive their, their income from agriculture. Only 20%. So even in such a district, you are outnumbered five to one, or four to one. And that sounded pretty bad, only 27. Do you know how many you've got today? Eleven. Eleven out of 435. Who do the others represent? Consumers people who want to buy their food cheap. And how does a congressman get elected? He really got two big jobs. First one, get himself elected. 
After he's got that done, then he starts on the second big job. Get reelected. <laughs> Do you believe that a congressman in New York City, Chicago, or Los Angeles is going to get himself elected by raising his constituents' food prices? <laughs> Even though they're wrong. I know they're wrong. They're going to take care of themselves first then who do you think is going to solve your problem? Who's we going are. to do it? We are. We are. You darn well better, because it isn't going to be done unless you do it. And if I am right, you have very, very little time left. And this is what I was going to do tonight hoping for an all-woman audience, or at least a great percentage of it. Because I believe that what I want to tell those ladies is what could solve or to go to a great extent to turn loose the forces that we need to solve this problem. But I am also very scared that if her husband is sitting beside her, that I may neutralize her because I'm not too sure that either she <laughs> or he, you can stay, Tom, you're thoroughly under control. <laughs> I'm not too sure that either she or he fully realize what makes him tick. Now, I'm going to give you examples. Every single one of them I'm going to give you are true, absolutely true, so help me. There are going to be stories about me, my wife, family in general. All of these things happen. And I think that perhaps I'm a little better posted than the average because psychology was one of my majors when I went to school. I think my whole life helped me see into the power of women. <laughs> I worship my mother, of course. To me, she's probably the finest that ever lived. So you better believe her influence was great on me. But there was something else that added to that. I was an only son among four sisters. <laughs> Well, I got married. And of course, when I got married, the only thing you could marry was a woman. <laughs> and we didn't have the whatevers around them. <laughs> My only child was a daughter. <laughs> so really, that's what I've had around me, women, females. And the power that they exert and influence is unbelievable. <laughs> I wouldn't know I was the best guy in the world. And I think if it hadn't been for my wife, let me chase her till she caught me. <laughs> I probably wouldn't or shouldn't even be loose today. <laughs> but it is unbelievable the effect that woman has had on me. And I am sure that every one of you men have been influenced the same way. I told you I was going to give you some examples of how it works, how it's done. They're really painless. Oh, they're so easy. <laughs> I've told you, most of you have heard me at some time or another tell the story about some ducks we bought at one time. My object of that story was, of course, altogether different than this one is tonight because I was getting at what the ducks cost and all the dreams about it, what they finally sold for. I'm going to retell you the first part of that story because I think that ties in very closely 
and illustrates what I'm trying to tell you girls. When I bought the farm that I'm living on today, for those of you who know the farm or have been over Interstate 29 and saw it, the interstate was not there at that time. And right across the road from me, going through where the interstate is today, there was a lake. It was an L-shaped lake. It came from the north, and then right in front of my yard, it turned west and went for about a half a mile. Not a big lake, but a beautiful thing. If you stood out in my yard, about all you could see when you looked west was water. Nice, blue, clean water. Well, one day, after we'd been there not too long, my wife met me in about the middle of the yard, and she was telling me how beautiful that lake was. And it's something to live across from such a beautiful lake. And isn't it a shame that this new house was about two years old then, that it wasn't built a little closer to that, we'd be able to see nothing but that lake. That's all she said that day. Next day, she met me again in the middle of that yard as I was coming across. And again, she was admiring that lake. And she says, wouldn't that be a beautiful sight if there were about 50 or 100 white ducks on it? <laughs> so all she said. Two or three days later, here she just happened to come across again when I was coming. And she said, isn't that something? A fellow really just doesn't know what he's missed when it comes to natural beauty until you get there. Sure, we never missed it till we got here, but wouldn't it be a shame to lose that beautiful lake? Wouldn't that be a beautiful sight? About 50, 100 white ducks on it? I agree, it sure would. <laughs> she did that about three times. About the third Dave, here she come home from town, and she said, guess what? <laughs> They've got little ducks, ducklings, uptown. And I think if we hurry, we can get some. <laughs> well, we hurried, and we got some. Now, we've been married over th about 35 years. And it's been pulled on me often enough that I know what's going to happen. The first day when she told me how beautiful 50 or 100 white ducks would look out on that lake, I knew for sure I'd go and buy at least 50 ducks. <laughs> the only thing I didn't know is when. <laughs> she hadn't told me that yet. That's an absolute truth. Nothing fictitious anywhere. It amused me, I think, more than it did you. She's clever at it, and I don't believe she knows she's doing it. <laughs> I want to tell you one other one that is very, very important to me now. Did not seem like it at the time. My wife was an orphan. Both of her parents died within two days during the flu epidemic of 1918. And so she was shuffled around from place to place till she finally got big enough on a job of her own and was able, let's say in a sense, to make a home which amounted to nothing more than renting a room in a private home. I was very hesitant to take her out on the farm. That's what I wanted to do. But she had never, ever spent a day of her life, not even one day visiting a farm. And I was leery of it, yet it was what I wanted to do. And she kept telling me that if I wanted it, she knew that she would like it. And finally there, too, I got asked, when we go and look at farms? And before I went into the Army, I had been a tenant. So we finally did. We bought a farm. Now, all of you that have ever heard me speak anywhere have heard me use the government statistics on the income in agriculture. And during the time when I was doing that, that's until the recent years, we were pretty much staying within the bracket of three to three and a half percent income on the investment 
and receiving absolutely nothing for our family labor. You've heard me say it years ago, and it just simply did not make sense to me that I continue that investment and that operation with no greater return than that. To show you how bad it really was, government bonds at that time paying four and a half percent interest. And so certainly nobody ever considered that a get-rich-quick proposition. Yet if I had sold everything I had, invested in, in government bonds, the government would mail me, would have mailed me. It wouldn't even have to go after it. One and a half percent more than I was receiving on that farm I wouldn't have had to do one single cent. I really could have started doing what I wanted to do all my life. Nothing. <laughs> and I'd have made a lot more money doing nothing. I figured it out to her over and over. I always got the same answer. The answer was, you can sell the South Farm. You can sell the land we've got in Nebraska. You can sell the livestock. You can sell the equipment. But this place ain't going. This is the only home I've ever known, and it's going to be taken away from me before I give it up. She was there. She was no longer using psychology. You'd tell me to score. <laughs> and I knew it would have to stick. Because selling the rest of the land meant nothing. The operation wasn't big enough if I got back down to the home place. So it's either continue or break her heart. That's about what it amounted to. Well, the more I thought it over, got to thinking, what is it that we're working for anyway? What is it that it's all about? And I could reach only one answer, happiness. So if it is buying happiness, it's got to be worth it. And it ceased to be a cold proposition to me. I not only liked it because of her, I learned to love it. And it didn't take me long to realize that if I was going to maintain that happiness, I was going to have to get out and fight for it. I had a little girl, a daughter. The reason I know that you ladies, every one of you has this within you, you're born with it. <laughs> that little girl, from when she was three years old, led me around by the nose. <laughs> and I loved every minute of it. Now, I've never had a son, but I've watched a lot of families that do. And in many, many families that I've seen, the boy, usually the oldest one, if there were more than one, was the apple of his dad's eye. But that little girl was leading him around by the nose <laughs> while the boy was being told what he going to do. <laughs> the little girl led the old man. It's that way in your home. If not in your home, you don't have the children, you watch your friends and neighbors. That little girl, she's got it. She helped me get a little bit in a hurry of organizing, too. We started organizing quite a while in NFO before the teachers took it on. She has two degrees in education. I gave her all the education that she wanted or would absorb. But with two degrees, a master's degree, she was teaching school in Omaha. I was operating a pretty large operation, 1,700 acres at the time. I had an all-row crop. I had two principal men. 
and I filled in with the boys from Skid Row in Sioux City, East 4th Street, if you've ever been there. Winos, people that sleep in the gutters at times. Those are the people that cleaned out the barns for me, did the dirty work, the manual labor. But do you know that they were getting more money for doing that?